A very good morning to all of you. I would like to welcome all the esteemed guests, faculty members and students to the second day of Ramanujan's Mathematics and Information Technology Conference 2016. I would like to welcome our very own Professor Prabhu. We welcome you, sir. Continuing the plethora of incredible talks from yesterday, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the day, Dr. Swaroop Kumar Mohalik. Dr. Swaroop is a Principal Engineer in Ericsson Research, Bangalore. Dr. Swaroop has a PhD in Computer Science from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, and has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at LABRI, University of Bordeaux, France. He has a B.Tech and M.Tech in Computer Science from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Prior to joining Ericsson, Dr. Swaroop worked at Intel, General Motors and Hewlett Packard. Dr. Swaroop's expertise is in the theorem of automata, logic and formal methods. He has been working in the areas of formal specification and verification of real-time embedded software, model-based testing and AI planning techniques. Dr. Saroop will be giving a talk on AI planning and execution in cyber-physical systems. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good morning to all of you. I will talk about uh, uh, planning and execution in autonomous, autonomous uh, cyber-physical systems. Uh, and there is a slider for uh, Ericsson Research where I work. The two major areas of work that uh, uh, we are involved in uh, the management and operation of uh, complex systems. This one, okay, okay, this one, uh, where we develop the right algorithms and framework for uh, the management aspects, and then the cloud technology, which provides the right kind of infrastructure to do the computation and communication necessary for these systems. Uh, the Domains that we are working on are this energy, transportation, healthcare, and safety, where all these things are being applied. These things have uh, gained importance because of uh, the emerging enablers, which are Internet of Things, the IoT, 5G, the new communication paradigm that is coming, and the big data analytics that all of you might know. So let's see, I'm not still. So the agenda for this talk, hope this is visible, it's not, not to me, uh, cyber, I will introduce what is uh, cyber physical systems and the need for autonomy, okay. So that is the main focus of this talk. Uh, and then I will show how one can achieve this autonomy in cyber physical systems, what kind of modules or components that are necessary. And then towards the end we will see some challenges and uh, uh, then we will finish with a little summary. So all of, we, uh, all of us uh, uh, know about the cyber systems which are the digital systems, essentially software running on some hardware. Okay? So this is the computation part, this is not only the computation but also the communication, the entire World Wide Web is essentially a network of computations talking to each other through some protocols. Okay? So these are the cyber or the digital systems that we know. Uh, in case of cyber physical systems, you add another aspect, which is the physical processes are thrown into the normal communication and com computation paradigms. Okay? Um, if you are uh, at, if you are accessing the web through some browser when you access some url so you get some page right these pages are actually written by or designed by human beings okay they have been put and they have been written and put in some server so when you access the url that actually is fetched but now uh, more and more uh, prominence is coming to automatic de data gathering and interpretation and visualization. Okay? So at some point, in fact now also it is there, all this, the pages that you are accessing will be generated by data automatically gathered from some physical processes like the temperature of certain place, the pressures 
exited in some on some truck for example okay by the luggage that is loaded on that all those things will be automatically coming to the pages and then you will be accessing that what does that mean now we have computation communication and the physical processes now tightly bound together okay this these are the cyber physical systems so as i said the three aspects to that the computation communication and the control which is the interaction with the physical if you want to see a kind of a framework now we have come from the digital to the communication to the physical processes together and if it looks like a very formal and all that it is not so uh in fact all of us know all of us actually might be uh, encountering that every day and uh, we all know the kind of there are some kind of systems at least in movies which, which interact with the physical world or the physical environment regularly okay do you know this okay <laughs> intense interaction with the physical environment right this one yes this is supposed to be a computer or whatever cyborg right what about this okay all of these if you see they are continuously interacting with the physical world okay that is what coming out from these pictures what about this what's the name okay full points this one r2d2 the older star trek and then this one yes all of this okay but they are very cute very nice but what about this these are also these are industry it has been there this kind of cps cyber physical systems have been there in the industry for a long time the industrial robots okay uh, they take care of lot of uncertainties in the environment they are deeply in the factory floor there are uncertainties of the placement of the things that are on the assembly line and they take care of that okay through sensors and then they actuate through their hands and what about this okay our life depends upon now many of these systems that are there which are continuously interacting with the physical world which is the motors the engines the cabin temperature etc air pressure in the um, in the in the tires okay for the comfort for safety all these things are becoming very essential unavoidable okay and then there are this wearables that are coming the fitbits the watches swatches and a huge amount of the google glasses so it's becoming ubiquitous everywhere you will find the cpss if you have not noticed you will be starting to notice now okay because they have become so they are becoming so common that you don't notice them and that's the best state that you now immersion can lead you to so this is a, whatever we have told is the textually it's here it says systems the cyber physical systems as embedded software that record data through sensors sense the physical environment so here you get the information from sensors and then analyze those things somewhere okay through your computation and then either automatically control or maybe you would like to just show it to somebody i uh, want to i want to see what is my how many steps i have walked today okay so that information is coming through this either directly or through this to my mobile and i can see that okay so this is the sensing and actuating but they also save recorded data interact with the other physical other other systems other digital systems other physical systems there are talks of you know, you know having your clothes okay there are sensors in the clothes which will tell you what kind of cloth is this and what kind of washing it needs so the moment you put in the washing machine the washing machine now senses what kind of clothes are there 
okay then it will set its parameters to do the right kind of washing so there are this your dresses are there with sensors that is understood by the washing machine okay and then that it gets actuated so different kinds of now objects with sensors and actuators they will be interacting with each other okay and then yes so uh, uh, there are sensors I will more difficult sensors which you can embed in your body and does not do anything okay body doesn't cannot do anything to it so this is these are much simpler ones so uh, the CP as, as I told CPS has a history has a, has a long history okay in simpler form but it has, a, it has a long history the term cyber physical systems came from a director in NSF or Helen Gill in 2006 it gained prominence as I say because of this cheap devices the sensors and actuators now you get this RFID tags you don't go get them in one or two they have become like nails you have to get them in hundreds of thousands okay from the retailers okay. they, they have become so cheap and then the enormous amount of computing power that is available and then the standardization which says in everybody should obey some kind of common terminology so that they can talk to each other otherwise the example that I gave the search sensor data will not be understood by the washing machine so that would be useless right so by the standardization you ensure that things can interact with each other nicely okay so the new characteristics as I say that we had simpler CPSs earlier okay very uh, cars and uh, industrial things but now the new characteristics because of are coming uh, sorry new characteristics that have emerged because of all this um, uh, all the things that I told the cheap devices cloud computing and all this are the scale of cyber physical systems and heterogeneity and mobility what is the scale by 2020 it's assumed uh, I mean it has been estimated that around 20 to 50 billion devices will be there in the world compare that to the population population will be around uh, 8 billion so on an average everybody will have two to two and a half devices that's an underestimate okay even now I think how many mobile phones everyone has at least one and then the watches the Fitbits etc are coming then I uh, the intelligent fridge washing machine etc are coming so on an average two and a half to five kind of devices people will have okay will be surrounded by them not only they won't be carrying the freeze with them so, okay so that that has uh, enormous impact on the infrastructure the kind of data they will be generating just imagine 20 billion devices each generating some amount of bytes per second you can calculate over the day how much data will be generated and if you want to analyze all of them the kind of compute power that you will need if you want to store what kind of storage you will need you can come up around petabytes of data per day will be generated okay so tremendous pressure on the infrastructure and then the performance requirements we know of Google cars okay autonomous cars okay. so there is some kind of interaction it needs with the infrastructure the road infrastructure um, the regulation infrastructure the police infrastructure all these have to be real-time okay very small latency that is necessary here okay so with all these devices the infrastructure that is already stressed has to manage the latencies the heterogeneity the different kind of devices are there many different companies are uh, building these uh, devices they come up with very different types the battery power battery power is different the size is different the protocols they support are different okay so that brings you into account lot of different kind of uh, heterogeneity into the system and managing them becomes very difficult and they have to interoperate in spite of all these differences they will have to talk to each other and then the mobility as if things were not bad I with all my devices I move from one place to another okay you know how difficult roaming is right it works here it does not work somewhere else that cannot happen now to a Google car okay if it is able to communicate here 
cross the state border, it, sh it should be able to operate. Okay? We cannot take away the bandwidth. So, with uh, all this, what has happened? The system complexity, I, I boil down to the final conclusion that the system complexity is growing to the extent that we need autonomy necessarily okay, to manage the systems or to manage the data that is coming out of the systems. Okay. So for the configuring the systems or the operation reconfiguration, you may need to uh, update all these things, the software or firmware and all this and to handle the faults. Okay. We need autonomy. You cannot, there cannot be any manual intervention in uh, say managing a, uh, a building full of sensors or actuators. Okay. And this should be autonomous because they will have to respond to uncertain environment and their variations because of the, of the mobility that I was talking about. Always things will be in flux and they will have to adjust to the new kind of environment all the time. Okay, it's as if you are there, you are fixed at one place, but the environment around you is changing very fast. Okay, so you'll have to constantly update yourself. Nobody will be there to actually tell you, you go and change yourself and adapt to the new environment. So, ultimately, we come to this: that the system should be self-star systems. They should self-configure, they should self-operate, and in case of problems, they should self-heal. Okay. Don't confuse the autonomy with automation. I especially wanted to emph emphasize this. Automated systems like this vending machine that you see, or many other systems, okay, they are told what to do. Uh, sorry, they are told how to do things. There are certain steps. If you press certain things, there is a certain steps that you have actually programmed them to do, okay. So that is, they are automatic. They are good. They are very nice, but they are automatic. What does that mean? That means if you just throw them into another environment or you press wrong sorts of keys, they can crash, okay? They will not adjust themselves to the new requirements. Autonomous systems, you don't specify how you want to do it. Okay? You just, tell, you just go and do this. Your goal is to reach at this place. Go in whatever you like. Then the system itself finds out how to go. Okay? It faces some difficulties, but still it has to go to the goal. It knows the goal is fixed, so it will find its way to, to the goal. Okay, that is the difference between the automated and autonomous systems. And uh, in case of autonomous systems, this adaptivity we call kind of that the system has some kind of intelligence. We are not talking about a very generic definition of intelligence. We are saying that so far as the system can adapt itself to new environments, we'll call it intelligent. And this is, this is the kind of autonomy that we want to actually build in, okay? So the so summary is the CPSs are ubiquitous, okay? We cannot avoid them. And because they are complex, the CPSs need autonomy, okay? Uh, just before going to the Next uh, uh, topic, subtopic, I wanted to show you, this is the some uh, sort of robots in the Amazon store, they are the robots built by, the robots built by Kiva systems and all these are autonomous systems, okay. They follow a path, they go to the racks, okay. They they will lift some uh, the entire pod, which has some kind of the loads that it has to actually deliver, and they will avoid each other on the way when they are going. This is the street driving, so many things will be coming, but automatically they adjust each other. Okay? So the see the complex environment from each each robot's point of view. Okay, there are so many things happening, but they will have to adjust to that and uh, do their goal. Okay, pick up, drop. So this is in on YouTube. So I think uh, you can see that 
I just wanted to uh, introduce some aspect of it. Okay, so so this is the kind of the autonomy that we would like to actually build into wherever possible. If there are small sensors and all that, possibly uh, it's not necessary. But wherever the systems can be autonomous, we want them to be behaving like this QR robots. So now the second part is actually I want to tell you how to achieve this autonomy, and this is one of the approaches. There can be many. Okay. The definition that I am taking of autonomy is uh, the capability to acquire knowledge and take some action based on the knowledge and then analyze or reflect on whatever you have done and this also may, uh, may be uh, some action of getting some more knowledge about the environment and then add to uh, uh, this box. So this will happen continuously. Okay. So this is the definition of autonomy would mean to actually have all these things in a in the autonomous systems. Okay. So what is knowledge now? Again, from uh, I mean from time immemorial we have been talking about some kind of the definitions of knowledge that have been philosophers talking about this but this is very practical definition and it has worked well in artificial intelligence field so i am taking that definition so we we kind of divide knowledge into two types of knowledge one is declarative okay declarative knowledge is describes the state of the world as a is a snapshot of the world okay at this point what is happening so like uh, the example shows here. It, it, show, it says the object state and the relationship among them. So uh, there are these three blocks, okay? Block A, block B, block C, and you say that table is a furniture, so that is another object, and the relationship among them. The A is on the table, B is on the table, C is on A. Okay? This shows the the relation or knowledge about this particular uh, situation here. If you want to take uh, the uh, another example, slightly bigger example, okay. So this is a railroad system, okay, where uh, there are trains are there, uh, there are some rails with segments, segments are named, so I can refer to them, and there are two uh, yards here, okay, with uh, uh, some loads and then, then there could be some crane, these are, these are two cranes possibly here, okay. So then I say that, so these are the objects, right, and then I say the relationship among them, so the T1, train 1 is at segment 1, train 2 is at segment 2, then I say that because S1 holds the train, it is occupied, so I am talking something about the current state you, you uh, recall, okay. And then uh, some segment is not occupied, that is the state of the world. And uh, I, I say the cranes are in these segments and the, the packages are at these uh, segments, etc. So this, this gives an idea of the declarative knowledge. If you want to describe the room here, perhaps you will say that, okay, there are so many chairs, there are so many persons, a person is on the chair. Uh, I am the speaker, etc., etc. Okay, so that gives the declarative knowledge. It doesn't say anything about the how things can change, which is part of the procedural knowledge. So we say we have declarative and procedural. Procedural knowledge says how things move because of certain actions. Okay, so essentially it describes the actions that you can perform on the states on the environment. Okay, so for example, here you are saying that there is a move action. Okay, it says that if uh, two blocks are clear, then you, you are, uh, I have written it wrongly, Y moves to the position X, okay? This is a little wrong, but, uh, okay. so, uh, okay, so, so, so uh, he, in this case, you just read it like this, uh, as it is, move X on Y, okay? Move X on Y, if you do that, after the state of the world changes. Initially, it was, for example, here, 
move B on A, move B on A, so it results in this state, okay? So if you are describing this in the declarative knowledge, that declarative knowledge will capture this now. And uh, uh, this is the procedure or the, the move action, uh, move was the action, we change the state, okay? This is the declarative, uh, uh, the procedural knowledge. It specifies the atomic procedures and how the state changes, okay? So this is another bigger example, uh, which says uh, lift X, okay? Some, some load is to be lifted. So you are saying that uh, you can lift an X if the X is on the table, the robot is near a table, robot's hand is empty, and the weight of this thing is less than 50. If it is more than 50 some units, then the robot cannot lift that, okay? So, uh, once that is done, then you can actually lift and that will result on the new state of the world. The X is not on Y, okay, uh, X is not on table actually here, X is not on table. The robot stays, it is just lifted, but it is still there, okay, so near, it is still near the table. The, uh, this thing is, the X object is in the hand of the robot and it is no more em empty, got it? So this is the procedure for lifting. So this is how you specify procedural knowledge. So now what do we do with this knowledge? We want to translate this into actions. Okay, we have declarative knowledge, we have procedural knowledge, we want to translate knowledge into uh, uh, action. In fact, sequence of actions which we can plan to arrive at a goal state starting from a current state. That is what we all want, right? Ultimately having just knowledge is not enough we want to actually apply that to achieve our goals. And uh, if I rephrase this, uh, because I am to, I have to derive a plan, so the problem is called planning, and uh, the givens are here, the description of actions, the procedural knowledge, the initial state and goal state. Initial state usually is the current state of whatever the agent that we are talking about, and a goal state. The question is whether we can automatically derive this execution sequences or plans that will lead from the initial state to the, the final state. So, initial to final state, okay? So, uh, if you see, the planning is actually a matter of choice. If there was no choice, only one action is available in every state, then uh, it's not interesting, okay? We would not be having this field, okay? So, there are different kind of choices at different states and we want to uh, optimize certain metric by choosing the uh, right uh, actions at the states. Okay, so this is either through the maze or a uh, um, lot of problems are there, right? TSP kind of problems. There are many examples, okay? That's what you want to do. Uh, little bit aside actually, this planning uh, came as early as artificial intelligence started in 1960s. With all these stalwarts here, uh, when artificial intelligence started, the problem solving uh, became the first kind of problems that artificial intelligence uh, would solve because that is what human beings do. And we want to actually build this intelligence into machines or in the, the, uh, the computers, okay? So now this problem solving means you want to, you are in a particular state and after the problem is solved, you are in different state. So this becomes a planning problem. And in what kind of choices that you want to make so that you will have reached the goal state, okay? So this becomes a such problem in AI, artificial intelligence, where the simplistic, the most direct way of solving a problem would be to actually uh, represent all the states in the state sp in the in the problem um, space that you are working on, and uh, these things these states are connected through the actions. Because that is what it takes you from one state to another, and then uh, you do a state space search. And because the state space usually is very large, okay, there there are a lot of techniques, fast search techniques, okay. Uh, a star, A star, some of you might be knowing, others will study, okay? These techniques uh, are used for solving the 
uh, the planning problem. Okay, so as an example, if I start with a initial state here and I want to go to a goal state, then uh, I can actually do two actions here. First, move the C and then B and then move C. Okay, so this three three step here, the three step um, sequence gives you the plan, the sequence of actions which will lead you from the initial state to the goal state. Okay, the uh, in general, uh, if I okay, come on, if I take uh, a state space, let's say this small state space with three binary variables, uh, then this is the entire state space. And if I specify that this is a goal state, this uh, sorry, this is the initial state and this is the goal state, and uh, uh, these are the restricted arrows. Not all arrows will. Uh, this is not a complete graph. Okay. <coughs> Uh, how does this uh, representation reflect continuous search in uh, continuous spaces? Continue, this, is, this is all uh, discrete spaces, okay? Yeah. The plan, so planning for, uh, I mean, the, that, that will be a different thing. We can talk towards the end or we'll see that. I'm not covering that part. So um, where the state changes continuously, that is not being addressed here, okay? So, so yeah, and then the path here uh, would give a plan. Essentially, those are the actions. Is that understandable? Okay. So, the coming back to the uh, the table problem, table and blocks problem. Perhaps this is a fragment of the entire state space here. Uh, so, you can see the state of the world, and then these are the moves. Uh, these are the actions, and you can choose certain these three actions and go to the goal state. Okay. So, this is what. The uh, plan uh, planning part. Okay. Uh, how much time? I have? Okay. No, I have a lot of time. So, in order to do this, there are lot of. Uh, I told you about uh, the different kind of algorithms to search in this state space. Okay. So, there are a lot of heuristics, and there are evolutionary algorithms. You would have heard of genetic algorithms etc and uh, swarm algorithms again some b b hive algorithm the ant colony algorithm etc etc there are a bunch of them to find the right kind i mean right kind of paths to go to the goal state so ultimately all of them are doing the same thing start from initial state go to the goal state through some path which minimizes or maximizes certain metrics okay and there are other techniques, um, satisfiability based and in general some constraint, constraint satisfaction based uh, methods. But we will see some simple search techniques um, that uh, suffice for many simple problems at least. Okay, so we have modeled the state space. So we get a graph. Okay, this it looks like a tree for this part, but it's okay. It's a, in general, it's a graph. And then we know all the breadth for search. Okay? level by level if i am uh, if i am in an initial state and i want to go to a goal state okay starting from here i explore level by level first all the things that are at one level away from me okay and then all the things that are two levels away from me so each time you go to something okay with the yeah i have explained so level by level you ex explore all the all the all the nodes and since this will occur in the graph somewhere at some level you will hit this okay and the moment you hit this you can actually if you have kept track how you came then it, you will get a path and that path will form your plan uh, yeah so this gives a better picture of uh, the levels here okay First, you start from here, and then all this, then all this, then the all like that. Okay. So this is uh, uh, with uniform cost. Okay, so each level has unit cost. So suppose you give now different uh, uh, costs to these edges. So what does that mean? That means going from one node to another, from here to here, it takes one unit, but from here to here, it takes uh, two units cost okay so you would like to actually not define the levels 
by just uh, just the adjacency, but by the costs. So what does that mean? That means you would now explore all the oh, yeah this one yeah all the things that are one unit away, all the things that are two units away, all the things that are three units away, etc. Okay, these colors give these are uh, say two plus one is three, and two plus one is three, and this is three. So these three are three units away from the initial uh, node. Okay, and these two are two units, and only this one is one unit away. So because of this weights, now the uh, the search um, the way you are searching becomes skewed. It's not uniform and level by level, but sometimes one, sometimes I mean, uh, yeah. Even though they are the adjacency wise, they would be in the uh, next to next levels. Uh, that can completely change the picture. Okay. So, but this is this is one way you can actually uh, uh, guide your search. Okay. This is, for example, a greedy search would actually ser take this one first. Okay. And then uh, from this, whatever the, because I am I am going to choose only the uh, the weights with two. I will choose any of any of these things. Uh, we, there may be more nodes, so I could choose the uh, one with two, okay, and so on. So this is this is the one of the approaches where you take the path cost uh, for your search this thing. So now uh, there is, okay. There is a very popular technique which uh, uh, was used uh, to to enhance this uh, kind of uh, uh, search because uh, the greedy searches usually would get stuck in some kind of local menus. Okay, so they may not give you the right, the optimal uh, path uh, for this particular search. Okay, so uh, there is uh, what you do in this case. Okay. You not only have the path cost that you have here, but also there should be weights here, which says how far they are from the goal node. That's an estimate. Okay, so this this H N here is an estimate, which says I have reached here, incurring certain cost, and then I will be incurring some more cost to go to the goal node. Okay, so then the entire thing. Entire cost that I will incur is actually the mix of both the things. What I have done and what I will be doing. Okay, so if you put them together, again now this graph becomes skewed. Okay, the shape of your uh, exploring actually becomes very different. Okay, so now you can use this for your search again. Okay, so if you again uh, pictorially, if uh, the uh, bread first search was like this, exploring like this. The A star and other the previous one will actually skew the search. So you will be actually going towards one direction more than the other directions. So hopefully that direction will lead to you to the goal state faster. So the planning is, is this search problem because we are doing a search in the graph is bec roughly. It becomes actually p space complete, which means it's uh, possibly uh, for large spaces you, it will be difficult to um, handle uh, uh, in reasonable time to handle uh, the planning problem. Okay, so you will need some kind of heuristics. So particularly when you are given a domain, you would like to actually see what kind of knowledge you can extract from the domain okay and build that into your search okay so uh, so that becomes very domain specific now so we'll have to actually look at the domain for example if you know that uh, some paths some pa you can take some kind of paths which always give, gives me um, let's say, say less traffic time okay then i would actually build that into the system so it will not explore the other paths at all so it will only look for this kind of paths where we have very less travel time okay so to reach uh, to my goal so this kind of knowledge will be necessary that is one thing the another thing is to combine the pl planning methods sometimes you that entire graph may you can actually build uh, break down into pieces in one part of the graph, you follow one kind of algorithm. In another part of the graph, you follow another kind of algorithm. Okay, some mix. 
okay or you can run multiple heuristics and take the best of them uh, uh, at the end <coughs> okay so now doing this what you have done you have done you have solved the planning problem okay so you start from you have your own goal you, uh, and then from the current state you know what kind of steps you will follow to uh, go to the the um, the final state okay so unless you execute those things you are not going to actually achieve the goal right so the planning for uh, the exam is very good but unless you sit down and work you are not going to get good marks okay so the hard work is necessary and typically this comes to the execution engines so there are uh, there are planning engines which will, will give you plans and there are execution engines which will take this plan and actually execute okay so so the, does the, the the traditional uh, planning the search through the state space and mm -hmm. all that seems sort of contradictory to what you talked about earlier right so if you, you now you're pretty much talking about a central uh, planning in some sense, mm -hmm. right? So you 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 do all the planning beforehand, okay, and then you let the system follow the plan. Yeah. So isn't this contradictory to the autonomy theme that you? Have? Yeah, I'll come to that. Come I'll to come to that. that. Okay. So uh, uh, now the execution unit uh, will execute uh, these plans. Okay. So uh, there is a uh, lot of difficulty, but this is mostly engineering difficulties here um, the kind of difficulties that we will face now conceptual or more uh, theoretical questions will come from the uh, different sources now uh, first let me complete one thing that plans that I talked were actual sequence of uh, actions but they need not be okay because we are talking about uh, uh, one agent we are talking about sequential plans but if we are talking about multiple agents multiple people multiple devices are there and they want to do certain things together like the two trains were there okay they have to pick up some load from one place to another okay so i don't want to actually let one train do one full route and then let the other train okay if there are roads then they should go parallelly why not that will maximize the use of resources so in general the plans can be uh, partially order okay partially order plans uh, like this I mean so, uh, so there are dependencies so uh, if I want to execute E then I must have finished D otherwise I cannot so one agent which does A and C must wait uh, uh, here before executing E and uh, that is what happens uh, here okay so if I have three agents executing that uh, partial order plan then I assign all this to let us say the execution units uh, know what all actions they can actually do they do execute so execution unit one will execute th this uh, second one does this third one does this and this is joint action okay like two robots coming to the same load and both lifting the things together so that is to be joint action uh, so then this guy now keeps track I have done A and I have done C I have to do E but I should get a notification from this second guy that he has finished D okay so I cannot go ahead uh, automatically so it has to keep track and then communication becomes unavoidable I need to communicate with the other guy to uh, be able to proceed okay and then for joint actions there is a protocol has to be there because now both of them have to be together both of them have to know that the other guy is also there near the table and then both of them can lift the table okay so this is the uh, slight uh, extension of the sequential plans and then we uh, come to this dealing with changes and uncertainty okay that is a more difficult part where uh, we know that and we do we do a plan okay now I want to go to Chennai I have booked and I know that all the routes are fixed I will land up in my uh, home uh, after following some paths and then when I am going I see that the floods have come okay so then what do I do okay I need to go home still so 
this kind of uncertainties you cannot take care sometimes you can i mean you would have thought of some plans if you are very systematic uh, about things uh, then you would have taken care of some uncertainties but you cannot take care of all the uncertainties that's a fact of life okay so uh, that is the uncertainties can come because the goals may change okay okay new goals may be added you may still have your own goals but new goals may be added so that you can take care of all the goals together perhaps okay and when you do some action you were saying that i was going to one state to another by following an action and that is how you followed the followed the path to the goal right i mean that is how it was computed but the actions may not give you the expected result if you if the robot if you have given the plan that move a to b okay now actually it doesn't go to b exactly it goes two inches before that and because of that it is not able to hold something okay so what do you do so the actions may not give you expected results okay and what these are all kind of negative kind of things but there can be some knowledge on the way you acquire some extra knowledge like some new road opening so you were not expecting that you had a plan but now the new road opening has come okay so now you would like to actually take advantage of that and follow a new plan right or in the in the ticket counter sometimes they open a new counter so people rush to the new counter right so that is actually you had planned to stand on the queue but now you are replanning okay so how to take care of these things so there are options now you can replan so you are monitoring continuously monitoring okay and then uh you replan uh completely okay so we start from your current state and then plan but that becomes very um you know uh, costly so what you would like to do actually is take the start from the, the current plan whatever you had but modify minimally so that computation of the replan will be minimized okay and if you have uh, new knowledge then the back the new knowledge into that and then you replan or modify the plan and this is where the adaptivity uh, comes in okay so now uh, there is there are other mechanisms i told you of one kind of handling uh, uncertainties there are other mechanisms where you model the uncertainties uh, on the transition itself on the on the actions itself uh, like if you are in a, in a state if you are in a state then if you do some action okay that will move action i told then the probability of that hitting the expected state is possibly 0.7 okay but it may go to another state with uh, some other probability okay that is the unexpected or uncertainty that you have in the domain okay you want to do something but it's uncertain you are not fully certain so you may land up in different states Okay. that is it and sometimes of course some some very deterministic kind of thing is there there is no problem okay uh, so it becomes as uh, mm, as old and then uh, i will not be covering this in fact i do, don't know much about these things uh, the the theory but we use these things in a black box way to derive certain kind of paths plans so oh, the there are reward functions there are different you, you can think that uh, each node here has some kind of reward so if you reach here you get some kind of reward if you reach here you reach, get this kind of reward so that means if you follow a path you will get some kind of expected rewards okay which will be this times this plus this time this you get some kind of reward okay and then you can minimize or maximize on that kind of reward rewards uh what does that mean you can now find a path which minimizes this uh, reward and this path you can have as your plan okay so it ultimately boils down to this getting the path okay so uh, this is another way of uh, deriving plans from uh, uh in the in the face of uncertainty and the uncertainty is built into this okay so uh, ultimately you will be building actually uh, when you are actually executing something now you have got this plan from this kind of situation then from this 
commonsensically perhaps in this example you can choose this action but in case you land up in this action uh, this state then you will be choosing this action okay normally you would have landed up here and then you would choose this action and come here but if in case actually in real life when you are executing you land up here you come to this okay right so now uh, you build all these things here. Yeah. We know all the edges for sure. Like I mean, robot does not know that it is going to fall in particular uh, scenario. Correct. So, so uh, are all the edges already foreseen? No, this these edges that I told you here. Uh, you initially, you model all this, okay? And then there are if you have actions that the robot can actually the falling robots are also there i mean they can actually lift themselves so the if the actions are available then they can use so that becomes part of the replan if they cannot then uh, nothing can be done but as such from okay. every state we have this edge of you know that robot can actions those things are essentially actions that are possible for the robot okay so if you bake all these things, the components the, into uh, this thing, we have the behavioral model of the real world, the procedural and declarative knowledge. Okay, you use the, some kind of planner or plan th synthesis algorithm to get the plans, and then you execute. Okay, which will affect the world. Okay, because you are uh, changing the world now. Because the moment you execute some action, it changes the world. Okay and you are sensing this okay so whether you have actually reached the desired state or no and then you can replan if there are some uncertainty some unexpected behavior happened and then from this you can learn and you can again bake that into your original model so this loop will go on okay this is this is the basis of uh, adaptivity and so called intelligence so now if you if you go back to your uh, machines that you have autonomous systems they would have some kind of loop this kind of things in their head here okay that is the basis of their intelligence okay this is the the cyber part will be there somewhere to actually compute all these things and then there are multiple agents and uh, the infrastructure with which it will be communicating that is there and this is the here which is the interacting with the physical processes and bringing in the right kind of intelligence that we are talking about okay then this is the autonomy in cps that i had promised okay so uh, i think i have fulfilled my promise to some extent any questions you can So these are my colleagues from uh, uh, Ericsson Research, Ram Badri, Mahesh, and Chandru. I just want to draw your attention to a few things uh, that autonomy implies. Uh, it, it all depends on the context, but yeah. uh, if there are entities mm -hmm. in a system which operate in an autonomous way, making use of resources that are available to them in the system and if the resources are in short supply automatically there is a game sort of situation correct it can be a two person game it can be a multi person game correct. so it can really really complicate issues yes uh, i think i did not go into so but this is fundamental hmm. to any kind of you know systems with the for example I have, uh, let's say, two robot arms operating in a very confined space. Yeah. And they have to do their jobs together. Auction, pick up together. Right. Thread it and so on. And they should not get into uh, in the way of each other. Right. Yeah. They have to operate in an autonomous way. But still, in a coordinated way. This kind of problem. Yeah. Know, Many degrees of freedom. Uh, that's so right, yeah. The thing is, how do I use my platform? That, that, that's one point. The second point is, you talk about communication. Mm -hmm. And in modern large scale cyber physical systems, systems communication is not instantaneous. Uh, yes. So there, there are delays in communication, and these delays cannot be temporarily specified. 
because of the kind of network that you send it, yeah. it all depends. Correct, yeah. you know, if the traffic is very really high, if it's packet switching, then maybe I'll get a packet. Yeah. After, 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 you know. So the temporal dimension for all these things that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. The third is, I'm forced to operate with the incomplete knowledge. Correct. Yeah. And I must, I must, you know, as an autonomous entity, I must be sure that even though I operate with incomplete knowledge, I'm not going to follow things up. So these are some of the basic things. So the that concept of feedback, the concept of yeah. continuous time, uh, uh, continuous behavior. Uh, state space systems, yeah. continuous time, discrete state space systems. Yes, discrete yeah. yeah. Right. There are all these things. We'll complicate things, right. You have all these so, aspects yeah. in modern cyber-physical systems. Correct, yes. Is, I just thought that I would... No, that is, that is excellent because uh, uh, I just wanted to introduce uh, this topic. The multi-agent case in AI, that is also from the, almost from the beginning of AI, that is addressed in the multi-agent kind of systems. And uh, uh, the games kind of things will come because of resource contention. There are sometimes, for example, traffic in uh, Bangalore, for example, okay? So that's a multi-agent system uh, example. You would like to go, okay? But if everybody wants to go, there will be deadlock. So somebody has to give away, okay? So uh, that kind of knowledge has to be now built in into the robots. The QR robots that we saw, they should not block each other. And they are actually doing some algorithm protocol to actually coordinate. In spite of the resource uh, limitation, they are actually coordinating and uh, getting their way done. The communication is uh, in practical system still, there are the latency issues are there. The idea is to actually reduce that as much as possible. Uh, going for, for the 5G kind of systems that will be coming in 1899. So there are uh, attempts to actually minimize the latency over uh, your uh, telecom network also to the extent that 10 millisecond latency will be guaranteed for you which will be enough for to drive Google car for example autonomously okay uh, so for a small area not a network there are faster protocols but this latency should definitely will be there if you want extremely fast uh, coordination mechanisms uh, I the, just wanted yeah. to draw you know this emerging but stability is one, one question mm -hmm. you would be surprised I mean you know in in, in good faith you just set up system and think that it will operate properly let, let me give you an example of modern power systems. They span across continents, as a matter of fact. And uh, there are dynamical systems. You, know, you have these huge machines, like three generators can supply the load of Bangalore City, for example. That's, that's the kind of size we are talking about. And large number of such systems. So in the United States, this is what happens. You know, the power system is set up operating, supplying power to various cities and road centers and so on. And then they see this following phenomenon. The Pacific area and the Midwest area slowly oscillating with respect to the future. So there are mm -hmm. power this whole area with a large number of generators, huge amount of power in the United States. That area acts as, as an entity coherent together and slowly it is operating, oscill oscillating with respect to the Pacific region. What do I mean by oscillation? If you track the power on the lines, the power goes on increasing. You know, on, on one side the machines start speeding up, it's not a large amount, but it is there. It's speeding up and the machines on the other side slow slowing down as if this whole thing is one entity and the other thing is another entity and there are sinusoidal oscillations emerging properly. You don't know how this happened, what you can do about it. What I'm trying to say is when you build autonomy and when you do freedom in all in good faith, there are all kinds of things which happen which can really be worrisome. So the point is these problems are not at all simple though of course you have it. Yeah. and uh, you have all kinds of systems like i said continuous time continuous state space discrete time continuous time discrete time discrete and finite state systems so uh, I, I thought that i would just no, mention it's a good thing that you've got the complexities also i tried to simplify it. <laughs> so uh, you had a slide on a star right? 
where you try to find a path from some origin to some goal. So a former student of mine, he did some work on finding multiple paths in, uh, you know, in a cluttered environment. Of course, there the context was robotics and UAVs and so on. But we did some work on doing finding multiple paths. Would that be of any use to you? Like, we are primarily determining multiple paths so that, you know, it's basically like finding plan B. So there is actually, um, usually what people do is they don't find a single plan. So, um, because the planning is lost. So usually uh, um, it could be, yeah, so multiple plans could be the way to actually quickly switch from one plan to another if they are actually uh, following close to each other. Because you are in some state, this path is uh, on some plan. The state on the other path could be here, so you could actually switch there and follow them. So this would be issue. So there yeah, is a kind of kind of plan is there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the challenge with the, this kind of planning mm -hmm. would be that uh, often the actions uh, that you have, uh, your the the procedural part of the knowledge. Not all of it is reversible. So, so you can't carry out the knowledge and then figure out that this is the wrong thing to do and step back and do something else. Right. So, right. so typically in, a, in an autonomous system, yeah. it, it needs to have certain safeguards to make sure that uh, catastrophic things do not happen. Yeah. Uh, because the actions are typically not reversible. Right. So, in other words, when you are actually planning, uh, they say you, uh, you plan step by step. And then you will have to follow some action at some stage. Okay. So this plan has given you some kind of guidance. Okay. You would have followed some some other action in, in, in that state in this. Okay. So this gave you the kind of a best uh, estimate of the reaching the goal at this stage. So you follow that. Okay. So in either case, there has to be uh, some kind of protocol of waypoints so where you can actually, if there, are, if there is any problem, so you actually form a small plan to go to the UA point, which is a safe UA point, and then you go to the end. So for example, if you want to, if there is an accident there in front and you are actually going, now what do you do? Your plan was to actually cross that side. Okay? You did not plan that. You are, now you face this problem. So you actually, there is a safe UA point which go to the side, okay? which, is a, which is a part of your um, the entire domain. So you go to the side and stop. And then the planning can take time or you can get actually uh, the new plan from somebody else. And then you can follow the plan. So that the reversibility, etc. is, uh, it may not be reversible, but there should be a way around. So to a safe, this is the kind of fault tolerance that talks about. Not this. Thank you, sir. In case there are any more questions, please feel free to discuss with her during the tea break. Uh, we've arranged for tea and snacks for everyone outside. Uh, let us break and meet again in 15 minutes. Thank you.